some of the chiropractors are certified where they can actually drain some of your um, your points on your face. Where I guess when you get traumatic events to your head, you actually get build up a fluid in your skull, and that's like hmm. what was causing. Like I had some really bad neck pain where I could like I could barely move my neck, and then I was getting really like really bad migraines to the point where you know I wouldn't be able to get like go outside or I I would have to lay down and close my eyes, but he's i've gotten it to a point just using him that uh you know i'm able to function so one of my name. my buddy michael hanthorn uh talked about how going to a cairo really helped him out for his i think a shoulder pain i think it like yeah. whatever the adjustment they did like fix something else on him um yeah, yeah so I the don't... whole alignment thing yeah we just get so screwed up being in the military i mean and our bodies are just so out of whack it, i mean he I'm on like year four working with him. So it's been a long pro process. And I think a lot of people just assume that, you know, hey, three sessions and I'll be good. It doesn't really work that way because you got so much stuff that's just, it's been so jacked up from, you know, all the stuff in the military. It's interesting because like different areas, the VA has very, you know, like out here, it's not too bad. I'm in San Diego. There's a lot of veterans yeah. here. And because of that, there's like, a couple different VA hospitals here, which kind of takes the workload off. And the one time, I mean, honestly, I only ever go in for my annual checkup. Um, a, a, like a year or so after I got out, I was having some issues with my back and went in and they almost immediately um, recommended me to a really good place out in town, you know? So it was yeah. like, so I hear people that complain about the VA and I get it, but it's like, I think it's varies by area, you know? It's tough yeah, for no, someone. Well, you live sure. kind of out in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah, I have to drive an hour. Um, there's like the main VA in Togus, and then, um, but that's an hour away. And then I, there's a smaller clinic, but that's you know 45 minutes to an hour if you don't get stuck behind a log truck. <laughs> so, and they don't. You would think with something like that, they would just give you like regular like cover your visits to a local, like a local yeah we had primary like, care we person. had. Yeah, we had Martin's points for a while, but when the whole um, COVID madness, um, COVID scan hit hard, um, me and my wife lost our medical for that just because we weren't playing the mask and all mm. that game. So we got kicked out of a lot of places. And um, Dude, I took my dog to the vet a, yeah. uh, in January and I had to wear a mask. I was like, what? Like when I, I thought the sign, there was a sign on the door, but I thought maybe it was just kind of left up there. Cause there's still places where there's signs, but they just, they just never took it down. And I went in and they're like, do you have a mask? And I'm like, no, I kind of laughed. I'm like, no. And they're like, well, here we have one for you. I mean, they didn't make a big yeah. deal about it, but I was like, this is pretty ridiculous. It's January, 2023. And this is, I think it's because it's falls under like a medical facility. And medical facilities still have to wear masks or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, they they all took the blood money, so they have to require it. Um, it's like anything. It's like I, I had my last final physical from my medical retirement to get put on um, permanently retired. So I had to drive all the way down to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to one of the Navy hospitals down there just to get a check in the box. Mm -hmm. And I walk in. I took I took Moose with me, my service dog, and we, we walked like two two stories in to the, to the second floor. Cause I just had to have like a chiropractor, well, not a chiropractor, but like a, one of those civilian dudes check me out for a couple things and then see a regular doctor. But, uh, yeah, like get all the way up in there, sit down, check in, fill out my paperwork. And then I get into the, the, the room and the guy's like, you need to put a mask on. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not doing that dude. And then we went round and about and he was like, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not helping you till you put a mask on. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not putting a mask on. So I was like, we could have been done already. I was like, <laughs> and it was just, it's stupid. I mean, they even got the, yeah. the CEO of uh, the Naval Hospital to come and talk to me. It was, it was pretty cool. That's fun. Yeah. You're now you're an old yeah. angry veteran. Wow. I won't. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really <laughs> angry. I just, I don't, I just don't want to we'll put do up it. with that crap. It's like it's crazy. Like I got it. And it's funny that we're starting with pandemic talk. Uh, I got it. I understood <laughs> at the beginning. It was like we don't know anything. You know, it was like we don't know anything that's going on. I mean, 
who knows what, you know, at the beginning I was like, okay, this is kind of a crazy thing and we're kind of figuring it out. But after a little while, you know, I was like, what are we doing? You know, when we started having all these exceptions for stuff, it was just like, this is crazy. Like I remember any, uh, there was all the protest obviously. And, but before those protests, like all the riots and stuff, there were all the nurses and doctors that were like walking out in lines to like stop the protest. But then they, but when the new protest, when the George Floyd riots happened, they were like, no, 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 this is like essential to, this is also a public health crisis. And I'm like, okay, this is all bullshit. That's when I was like, okay, this is stupid. This is like, this is what are we doing? You know? Yeah. Me and Steph looked at it early on and we're like, well, maybe this is, did you get COVID? Yeah. You know, I mean, not what they call COVID. I mean, I've had like the flu symptoms. And yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like the flu, but without being yeah. able to taste anything. Yeah, I mean, we lost. I lost my taste um, a couple years back um, for whatever reason, but um, it wasn't like anything. It put it put us down for a couple of days. It wasn't a big deal. Yeah, um, but you know, it's funny because like you know, from a military aspect, you look at it and like all the propaganda that they were, they were shooting across from China, like these people dropping dead in the streets. And I'm like, Oh, if it's that bad, then I'm going to need a, a C, you know, a, a CBN masks, like with yeah. charcoal filters and like full mop four for this, you know, if, yeah. it's, if it's as bad as it would say, you know? And then when people weren't dropping dead in, in America, I was like, Oh, this is all BS. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not fully, but it was definitely, I think the um, shenanigans went on way longer than they should have. You know, I think technically we're still in the state of emergency. I don't think, uh, I think it's supposed to end this month or next month or something like that. I think tech, and it's because of the money and the ability to do yeah. different things with that. I mean, so. we're, America's in, in full tyranny at this point. I mean, there's always going to be a perpetual emergency to keep these powers going and, I don't know, man. I, I, I hear, I know the argument for that. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case though. I think people are really coming around. I think independent news outlets are coming out. You, you use gab, right? That's the only social media that you're on. Mm-hmm. I think from last time. Yep. So like independent social mm-hmm. media sites like that, uh, what uh, one video site rumble is getting really big. I I've, I've thought about putting all my stuff on rumble too. I haven't done it yet. Yeah, you should you rumble or break on. There's a lot of good sites out there, but I, I'm just saying from a standpoint of our government, it's in full capture at this point. Like, I don't think there's a political solution for anything that's actually happening right now. It, most of it's a fake fight. I mean, it's the there's left a lot and of the noise. right, but it's, yeah, it's the left and the right, but it's just, it's just a different wing of the same bird flying straight to hell. I mean, this is just at this point, I just, you know, I look at, I look to God for that and, to guide me on that. And, you know, I got to just focus on my family at this point And I tell most move in that direction. I tell most people that get that seem or feel overwhelmed by like the news and the government and this is happening and that's happening. It's like, dude, just go outside and kind of like say hi to your neighbor. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. you watch the TV and it says everyone's angry at each other and all this bad stuff's happening. But then you walk outside and tell you, Hey, what's up, man? Hey, local corner store guy I see, you know, a couple times a week. Hey, you know, people are actually getting along and it's not really that bad. One thing. Second thing, it's like, if you want to really focus on government stuff, you really need to focus on local government stuff because that's where, that's where you're really affected. Big government is affects a lot of stuff, but local governments where it's really nickel and dime you, you know? Yeah. This is pushing more of a small community movement. I mean, we're up in rural Maine. Um, There's like 700 people in our town, but you know, it's a small community, you know, we have, we have a farm here. So, you know, we're just kind of trying to live the agrarian lifestyle, but also like in the community mindset where we're helping our neighbors they're helping us. And we kind of kind of builds like a parallel ecosystem, you know, outside the beast system. So mm-hmm. just kind of just shield ourselves from, from the turmoil as much as we can, you know. Isn't it kind of crazy that you're, you're moving to a lifestyle, like more like the people in Afghanistan, than people in the u.s you know what i'm saying like it's like yeah, it's mean, like the lifestyle of the afghans but without you know with technology well afghans or iraq i mean even some of the places in somalia we were at some of the best mangoes i had was in somalia i mean 
yeah, I mean, the, the older I get, the more I realize like technology and having the finer things of life isn't just isn't what it's made out to be. It's it's your community, it's your family, it's you know just just building that relationship with God and kind of going in that direction. And um, you know, the farm and lifestyle works for us. Um, it's good for our kids. They like it, and it gives us a chance to raise them kind of in the the mindset of you know you gotta got to go out and you got to work hard and um but at the end of the day you know you get to eat some some food that you you grew and you yeah know, so yeah for sure did. yeah and you're pretty yeah. busy man i know we've talked a couple times and you're always like doing something with the farm what are you guys because different you guys are harvesting different stuff in different seasons do you guys sell i know you have your website uh full was it fullarmorfarm.com yep that's correct okay yeah I ha- you have your website where you guys uh, have more information there but do you guys also is it like a co-op with like other local farms or is it just all strictly from you guys yeah right now we're just trying to do from our farm we kind of um so right now um we looked into selling other places but i'm i'm kind of just trying to because we had to do a full um from from scratch farm build when we moved up here we we didn't really know that we were going to be farming until you know uh, me and my wife were looking at retirement and then Steph kind of suggested, hey, you know, maybe you should look into like farming. And so we looked into that and that's kind of where we went with it. So when we moved up here, we, you know, we already had the house, but it wasn't really an active farm. So we kind of had to build from scratch. So we've kind of been taking it slow. Um, and I built, I built a pretty niche market now, especially on Gab. And then just in the local community, I sell from, from our farm porch. Um, so I haven't had to yet to actually kind of, expand my market in that way with um well i guess you were saying for like a uh like a cs cas or a uh community supported agriculture mm-hmm. is that what you were talking about yeah yeah i kind i kind of do that but I, I, it's more of a um the friends that i know like i got a buddy that um he retired he was in marsoc with me and at dev group and he's like five miles down the road so like he comes and helps I, i'll raise the chickens and he'll come and help slaughter, um, do stuff like that. And then there's some other guys that I trade, um, you know, like milling lumber for and, and food for and stuff like that. So there's a lot of kind of barter and kind of going on too up here. That's cool, man. That's old school. You know, yeah. that's like, uh, um, yeah. it's good though, because it's real skills, you know, it's like real world. I mess with computers all day and do stuff with websites. Like, but if if the shit hit the fan, that's not going to feed me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's, it's a different world that you're living and I, and I'm living in the city surrounded by concrete, you know, asphalt right here in the middle of San Diego. So it's, yeah. Why well, don't you have an egress plan? That's, that's all you need, man. Like, not everybody <laughs> can farm, you know, but yeah, I got buddies that live in the city that, you know, that they have a plan to get out if things start to collapse. So it's just really just, just always have a plan, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But right no, now is, is definitely a busy time of year on the farm. We're doing maple syrup right now. So, um, busy time of year collecting sap and then, uh, boiling it down into maple syrup. So it's been a good year so far. Um, we've made twice what we made last year already. So it's, 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 it's That's good, like man. It's going to be a really good year. That's awesome. That's what I love seeing guys that get out and are successful in their, their ventures, you know, and they're taking a risk doing something different. You know, I think it's, I, t- I was just saying this to somebody earlier. I was like, uh, that moment when you're getting out, you have all these, that's like a real opportunity to try to do something you always wanted to do because you have all these benefits and stuff that can help support you. Whereas if you were just a regular person trying to go do something, you may not have like maybe some VA disability money coming in, maybe some retirement money coming in that can help sustain you while you're growing whatever it is that you're trying to work on, you know, and I really encourage people to think outside the box, you know, unless you want to go get out and a lot of people want to get out and work in corporate world. And I'm like, man, sitting in a cubicle does not sound cool. You know, like working like that just doesn't, doesn't jive really. So you got to try something different, you know, if it, if it's calling you. Yeah. And I think, I think I, I would hope more veterans are looking at f- doing farming as, you know, a, a, an option when they retire, they, 
they they're looking for a second career or even like a supplemental thing to do just to keep, stay active um it's it's very therapeutic um it definitely helped me with my uh with my ptsd and stuff and, and just kind of having your hands in the dirt and then you know we have cattle here too and, and poultry so you know it's just not me that i gotta worry about so i gotta get up in the morning i gotta look after you know eight to 12 head of cattle and, you know, a bunch of chickens that don't care about my problems. They just want to be said. So, yeah. you know, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. All right, yeah. man, let's, um, so on the last episode, we, we kind of got, we went through your career all the way up into your time at second Anglico. And then we were, I think we started yeah. to talk about how you moved over to Marsoc fires. Um, so let's pick up there. You know, when you went over to Marsoc Fires, what was your kind of expectations at the unit? Like, what were you expecting to do at the unit? And then what were they expecting from you? Oh, so that was July 2008 that I got um, orders over there. And initially, I went to the Marine Special Operations Support Group. So at the time, prior to that, they, they had the JTAC were aligned straight with the team. So they didn't actually have a fires platoon or a cell that they were actually putting all the JTACs in. Um, and this was kind of the start of it. It's kind of like my same process when I, yeah. when we were boot dropped into Anglico when Anglico first stood back up, you know, when it switched over from L MLE to, to Anglico. So they were looking for a bunch of guys. So like, it was me, uh, you know, Dennis Kanzler, Salisbury, um, uh, and a bunch of other guys that, that all came over pretty much around the same time um, to stand up the fire cell. Um, expectation wise, I don't know, man, like it's kind of like you're feeding from a fire hose at that point. Like I wasn't even a JTAC going over there. So, um, you know, I got over there and then I think, you know, in July and then in October, I went, I went, um, no, October, I got certified as a JTAC. So a little bit prior to that, I, I went to, you know, SOTAC. So, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I was hoping, obviously hoping to go to a team, but I, I don't know if that was an expectation. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where all roads lead, right? Unless you're just not that good. And then if that's the case, they're not going to keep you yeah. around, I would assume. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I was hoping for a team. <laughs> yeah. How long were you yeah. there before but, you uh, got picked up with your first team? Uh, March, 2009 was my first deployment with, uh, with M eight two one two. So we picked, I picked up, I think right after I got certified in October. Um, but I got to, I got to that team, which that was, um, Fox company's team. Um, I don't know if you, you I'm sure you've heard about like, uh, Fred, uh, Galvin's, yeah. um, Marsoc. Yeah, he's Marsoc been on company. a couple times yeah, actually. Yeah. So his, his I was the second Fox company. Um so I came in right after that their their deployment got back. So it was kind of an interesting transition period and I I didn't know any of this until like years later that they, that it all happened in in Afghanistan. So I came in like boot JTAC like um they don't know who I am or care. And I get placed on, um, at the time I got placed with 8213 on Fox Company and they had already done their shooting package. So they were, you know, a quarter away through their workup and, you know, it wasn't like, they didn't really care who I was. They, you know, they, there's a lot of whisperings of there's still investigations going on. So there was like, I, I don't know if it was mistrust, but it, there was a sense of like, don't trust that guy and i i can't blame him you know after mm -hmm. after i hear like what happened to them and i'm like holy moly and then after that you know it happened to some of my buddies where they got they got put up on murder charges or accused of dropping bombs on guys that were civilians which weren't civilians you know and then it all plays out and then you know it ruins the guy's career and and to find out it was it was a legitimate strike um so yeah it was it was a little rough uh, you know, integrating in with a team, but, you know, I can't really, I don't, you know, hold a grudge or anything for that. And then, you know, uh, team wise, um, they had um, one of their shooters on the team was, uh, became a JTAC around the same time. So they, they kicked me over to 8212. 
which turned out was going to be the commando mission anyway. So they wanted to have at least a couple of JTACs on, on that team for the commando mission. So, and then we departed and went and, and deployed uh, March of 2009 and then went over to, um, we were out of Shindan, Afghanistan, um, which is kind of like, uh, I want to say it's like Northwestern uh, Afghanistan, just south of Herat. So it was an old, um, Russian air base back during the 80s when they were they were in uh, Afghanistan so it still had it had a nice runway there um, so you know we could accept c-17s and c-130s and you know just don't just watch the craters as you're coming in you know and yeah. <laughs> one two zero you know <laughs> that's funny uh, but, I'm, uh, I'm sure the pilots yeah, love landing there too you know that's always a good time and I'm sure the Taliban kept it sporty you know uh, can you explain what the commando mission is for those that may not know and like maybe the difference uh, to what their other missions are? Yeah, so we were with the 4th Kandak uh, commandos. So those were there for the Afghans. They were the special forces guys of, of the Afghan army. Um, so our main mission on that deployment was just level two um, and level one, um, like helicopter raids and uh, so we would do mostly capture kills for those. Um, early on in the deployment, we were mostly just doing ground assault force missions. So we were doing a lot of driving around in, in our GMVs, um, which was kind of cool. That I was thinking about that today. Um, we took some long, like three, four day drives from Shindan and just went all the way up to like the Turkmenistan border and stuff. And um, yeah, we, we went into this one village and we came through this wadi and then creeped up this mountain and we had mountains on both sides of us and then it's like this big mountain bowl area and you can't see inside of it until you get through the um basically it was almost like a gate that you could barely drive a gmv through and then there's like this little village inside and i'm like man this is cool like it's just out in the middle of nowhere, you wouldn't even know it was there if, if you hadn't uh, like drived up on it. And like a lot of these little villages and coochie camps we're driving to, like they're like, are you guys Russian? <laughs> they hadn't seen like anybody in a while. So that was kind of cool seeing like how other people lived, you know? Um, yeah, for sure. But um, so that was kind of the first couple months um, at that time. So it, uh, us being the second Fox, um, I, you know, we were kind of on a short leash. They had, they had partnered us with um, a seventh group team for the first part of that deployment, um, which we, we didn't really get along with those guys. So they kind of, they were kind of doing the uh, working with the Afghan commandos and we were doing kind of our own thing with the gaff. And then 7326 ODA came in about halfway through and those guys were like good to go. Like uh, a lot of our guys had worked with them before mm -hmm. and it was just like, we combined our teams. So it was just one team, one fight. And then we just focused straight on the commando stuff and just started doing, you know, the level one, level two, you know, capture kill raids. And we started partnering with um, the DEA fast teams at the time too, uh, working with the department of state. And those, the DEA fast teams were kind of focused solely on high level drug guys, um, and then big market bazaars that are filled with like drugs and weapons and, and that kind of uh, just the logistics uh, movement of all that stuff. So, so they, did they, they didn't really care about like the actual opium poppy growing so much. They were more about the product or like the afterwards, how they were processing it and, and uh, getting it out. Yeah, it was weird because at, at that time, even in 09, we had specific orders that we couldn't touch poppy fields unless we got like approval. And then, which I get because, you know, that's the way that that worked is most of those farmers were like, basically, they had no other way of making money. Poppy was the best money maker for, for crops and the Taliban basically wouldn't pay them till they got the crop. So you burn their crop and the farmer's going to starve or get beat or killed. So I get it. Um, so yeah, we were focused mostly on um, the networks and then the high level dudes and then the, the drug bazaars. So like one of, one of the missions we did uh, 
um, I, I can get into that off right now. That was um, Operation Lexington in October. So um, we did that with the DEA FAST teams um, and the and 160th um, SOAR guys brought us in on that mission. And we went to um, Dari Boom, Afghanistan, which was, um, it was about 30 or 40 clicks north of, of Herat. It's ended up being my next follow on deployment is where I got put there for a VSP. But on this mission, you know, we were, we were going specifically a, after a drug, drug bazaar. So this bazaar was like, it was oriented um, basically, you know, um, east west in this kind of this uh, north south like running valley and it was surrounded by mountains so like the bazaar was like right at the base of a mountain which made it very um very interesting for getting helicopters in there um, there's quite a few lz's to the south of it that we worked so we came in, um, we did a 300 meter offset with, with the 160th and landed and, and went in. Uh, we took, you know, we had guys squirting immediately off the objective. And then, you know, we had known fighting positions from Intel that these guys would probably go up that mountain. And there was a couple spots where they actually had, you know, machine, machine gun emplacements. So immediately we were already engaging guys. We got a couple guys with AC-130s right off the bat. And then, um, you know, once we got into clearance, we got through that, and then we had a couple, um, a couple of our teams that had set in um, fighting positions, um, just blocking positions while we did the clearance and stuff. And th those guys got lit up by a couple different squads of guys. We, you know, we were estimating that you know anywhere from like 25 to 30 enemy fighters came up and actually started attacking our position to, to overwhelm us. And the intel reports at the time for that for that op was that they, those guys had the ability to surge 50 to 100 fighters into that valley so it was it was a no joke um and they did they surged at least 30 into that valley and they had more guys come in um so we we lit those guys up with you know ac-130s and and the a-10s and um cleaned those guys up pretty good and then um we you know blew up all the um we got a ton of drugs and um, like weapons, RPGs, uh, you know, remote detonated IEDs, and this, it was, I mean, the bazaar was full of stuff. So we blew that stuff up and then we went on, went to Xville and uh, I was in the lead bird on Xville or yeah, so I was, I was in the lead bird on Xville and then um, uh, we took off and you know, on Xville, you know, I got on ITS in the aircraft, so I was, you know, last man in, get on headset, and we take off, and we keep circling, and, you know, I'm trying to, like, figure out what the heck's going on on the radio. They're, they're saying aircraft's down, um, but it's like, is it down on the deck, or has it taken off? Like, and then, you know, finally, it was like, you know, um, the 160th bird crashed, um, so we made the decision right there to reinsert. Um, so the, they put our bird back in 300 meters um, south of the crash site. So, I, you know, when we, when we took off, we actually called a, um, a closer in LZ. It was actually a pre-planned LZ, but it was our Kazavac LZ, which was like probably 10 feet from the bazaar. It was really close, but it was, it was a, our best exfil um, for that mission just because of how much enemy fire we had taken mm -hmm. um, so we made that decision and it ended up being a really bad lz it was just full of really just that fine sand mm. and you know from what we can tell so everybody you know it browned out uh the second bird you know um chief warrant officer montgomery and lions were were in the second bird and you know from what we we, we we gather I, I don't I don't know I didn't see the follow-on reports from from the 160th but it looked like that maybe they browned out they got disoriented and from what we see in the crash site it looks like that maybe they they were going towards the mountain and then they overcorrected and lost power and basically it, 
they lost power and they they crashed the aircraft into one of the the buildings into the bazaar. So um, that's got to so be we surreal. That's got to be so surreal when you hear that. I mean, you're listening to them, the comms on the radio and stuff, and then now you know you're going back into something like that. Yeah, and it was. Yeah, I mean, it was it was like that's supposed to be a three hour mission, and so like we're we're literally carrying what we could carry on our persons, you know, we weren't ready. I mean, we had like one water bottle, you know, one of those, you, you crush the water bottle before you get off the aircraft and leave your, your cold weather gear on the aircraft and jump off, you know? And uh, so, yeah, they, you know, they gave, gave us the, Hey, we're, we're putting the bird back in. They put us back in 300 meters away from the crash site. And, you know, how's the first one off? And I'm like, crap this is gonna suck and i had the ac-130 mark the uh, the crash site and i just started running for the crash site you know we just kind of hey everybody just start moving towards the crash site by the time i got to the crash site um everything was cooking off obviously the, the rounds were on the on the gals were going off and but from from what i can gather um the oda chief warrant officer was able to help and get guys organized and they pulled everybody off the bird that they could get um in, and they already had a casualty co collection point in one of the buildings near to the crash site already set up um so and then we started working getting guys to um to stre on stretchers that couldn't can be that weren't mobile and then started moving guys to the the first um 160th bird for for exfil um I think I think we exfilled like 26 to 28 guys for um, for that mission. Um, yeah, it was yeah tw for for wounded guys, and then we we lost 10 guys in the chopper. So we lost um, two of the ODA guys on our team, um, David Metzger and Keith Bishop. They perished in the crash. Um, and then we lost three of the DEA fast team guys. We watched, lost Weeman, Chad Michael, and then Michael Weston. And then we lost um, the, uh, you know, four or six um, of the 160th SOAR guys. We lost uh, Sergeant Hernandez Chavez, Staff Sergeant McNabb, Sergeant Mueller, and then Chief Warrant Officer Montgomery and Chief Warrant Officer Lyons. They all perished on the crash. Um, so, at that time, we were basically um, trying to get everybody that we could onto, onto the first chopper because the 160th guys were like, hey, we only got 30 minutes of gas, so we need to get as many people, and, you know, we're 300 meters away. So, I mean, if you, I'm sure you've done medevacs before. You know, this, this is not a quick process. It doesn't matter how many guys you have, mm -hmm. especially when you got guys that are litter and they can't move. Um, I think we made two or three trips to the chopper um carrying guys i was controlling helping i think our erd guy um hub uh carry uh you know these guys like uh, you know firemen carry and like uh like kind of like the two-man carry one under the leg kind of thing mm. uh, and you know the enemy started uh coming in creeping in they knew something had happened so they started probing um I, I ran a couple A-10 gun runs on guys while the uh, uh, C-1, um, the uh, CH-47, 160th guys that were on the deck, they were matching rounds with their gals on guys off on the deck too that were trying to attack. So it was pretty dynamic. We, you know, it took us, I don't know how long to get them loaded. It took, it had to take more than 30 minutes to get those guys loaded up. And, you know, by the grace of God, you know, he, he had enough gas to get back. Um, I'm sure it was, it was real tight. Um, and then we found out after, um, after the 160th bird took off and left, we found out we had it one more um, casualty. So um, by whoever thought it was a good idea to integrate Spanish Kazovac, they sent a Spanish bird uh, in, which was a goat rope. Can't talk to him. I mean, it was, it was a horrible experience. Um, they came in, no comms. Um, they ran through 
um, I was attacking with A10s, and they were they were running through basically when I was about to do some gun runs with those. So I had to like abort the A10s to get those guys on the deck, and Jeez. it could have been it could it was yeah it was a nightmare, but you know at least we didn't shoot the Spanish dudes out of the sky. But. How did how did they miss a casualty, or was it just someone that just didn't say anything until the? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I don't know to be honest with you. I mean, it was so chaotic. I yeah. Mean, were, were they stacking the aircraft? Manpower. Were they stacking you with aircraft when all this went down? I imagine they just started pushing you all kinds of stuff. Yeah, they actually they called our team missing in action, which spun up the all the personal recovery um, oh. guys and all the assets associated with the personal recovery. So, I actually, found out this later. Um, I was going through an advanced um, tier uh, school when I was um, in later on in in in, in my career, and a guy that was teaching the class was telling a story about his last like personal recovery mission that went fully, you know, it went full, full tilt. All the assets were called in and he's talking about that. I'm like, I think that's my mission. (laughs) So it was good to see his perspective, you know, sitting a jock and then how, how they work the whole mission from, you know, Marshall and assets. Like I had two or three P3 Orions overhead doing SIGINT stuff and their their whiz bang stuff overhead. And I had a couple A10s, AC130s. Like you know, I had like you know 10 to 11 aircraft in the stack for for the majority of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was pretty pretty wild. Um, and then you know once once the Spanish bird got out of there, it kind of quieted it down. We did you know a couple more engagements, but. It kind of quieted down after that, and then we we had to extract the bodies at that point. We had um, the Rangers come in a little bit later with their PJs, um, so the pararescue guys came in. They came in on Blackhawks, inserted, helped us, um, you know, um, plus up our 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 position so we could we could we didn't have to look outboard. We could focus on um, recovering the Americans. Um, so that took, I mean, most of the day to get those guys out and then we extracted. Um, yeah, it was. How does a debrief for a mission like that go? You know, when it goes that something like that crazy happens during it, does it, does the debrief change for you or does it still feel, I mean, it's just so, cause debriefs a lot of times are very, they feel sanitized cause you're just saying what happened, but it's like, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I you talk about may, maybe going in more detail and being meticulous about how you debrief because some some bigger event happened. Yeah, maybe um, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I would say for that deployment, we had we had you know Captain Glover and and, and Lambo were were our um, our officers and and our uh, and our team sergeant. They were and they were rock solid probably some of the best leadership that that i've ever worked with for for the team level guys and our debriefs were always like very i i just remember them being long and meticulous Mm -hmm. um so i i don't know if there'd be any change for that deployment but yeah i I see what you're saying um yeah there's some times where you just want to get through it because nothing happened um but i think that's one thing we do good in special ops is um, we're very meticulous at debriefs because, um, and th- and that's the time when you know you have to be humble in mm-hmm. in special operations because you have to be able to admit that you made a mistake because if you can't look at the, the guy to the left and right of you, you know when you're only going in like five to ten dudes in onto a onto a you know a, in an operation and you can't you can't admit your mistakes man you can't trust that guy, you know you got to be humble so. You know, unfortunately, I've, I've had to humble myself quite a few times because I've made a lot of mistakes. Well, I mean, so. I mean, I think everyone does, you know, it's just, it's the nature of the beast, right? And I like, that was probably the one of the best parts of being a, being a JTAC was the meritocracy behind it, right? It's like, you either get it or you don't, you know, you're either good at it or you're not, you know what I'm saying? Like you... There's no question. Either you did something unsafe or, you know, it, it, you did it or you didn't. And it really weeds out the guys, like the gray man guys that just kind of exist, 
you, you know, they they move into the ranks or whatever, and they they can say some of the buzzwords, but they can't actually they can't actually act. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, no, I agree. So I really like that, and I imagine. I mean, that that's got to be the draw, right? I mean, that's why people want to go there because you're there in special operations specifically because you're there with people that want to be there, and everybody's trying hard to not be you know, to be awesome at their job, obviously. And even if you're like the worst guy on a special operations team, cause there's always a worst, you know, yeah. you're still probably pretty, you know, in a pretty good spot compared to the general forces. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I, I think that's not a surprise that, that you really like that and that people are drawn to that. Cause you're, you want to be out there with people that want to be there. Right. You know, like I don't want to be next to a guy that I can't trust and he doesn't want to be here. Because that's just that's yeah, just no, scary as fuck. exactly. Yeah, that was my draw to going over to Marsoc from Anglico because there's a lot of people at Anglico at the time that you know we needed bodies and there's a lot of guys that didn't want to be there and they 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 acted like it and we couldn't get rid of them. Yeah, so I was like, I need to go through something where everybody wants to be here and and I've always tried to be in places where I don't feel like I'm the best. So I always have to work a little bit harder, you know, so I don't let those guys around me down because they're better than me. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's good for being just a manhood thing too. just always being checked. Um, that you're not the, you're not the coolest, coolest dude in the, in the squad, you know, <laughs> for sure. I feel like that yeah. every time I interview somebody on the podcast, I'm like, <laughs> man, I didn't do shit. <laughs> you know, when I have people like you or freaking some of these Delta guys that have come on and stuff like that. But it's one of those things where I, and Boy, I've come, cooler, you, know? you never, well, I, like I always tell people, you can't stack your service against somebody else's. No. It's just too different. You know, it's just not fair to you. And honestly, if you, the coolest guy in the room, you know, if you're the coolest, of, there's always someone, there's always going to be someone cooler than you. And if you aren't, you know, if there isn't, you're the coolest guy out there, then that probably comes with a lot of baggage from the, from the stuff that you've had to go through. So, yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about, you know, following an issue or an incident like that. Do you guys take a stand down or anything, or is it right, right into, you know, more Hilo raids? I mean, I, I wish we had, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that was a busy deployment. I mean, before that we had um, another op, um, Operation Red Thunder that was in September. So the month before that, that, it was a huge op. We had over a hundred special ops dudes and then 900 of the Afghan commandos Jeez. and SF um, guys. And we went into um, Shawan, which I think it, it's north of Helmand mm -hmm. by a little ways. But at the time in 09, that was basically the C C2 node for that area. And then that's where they were doing all the training. Um, they had a lot of foreign fighters there. Um, so they wanted us basically. So my team got, because we had the commandos, we were going to be the first ones in. So we went in, I think, 12 hours before they had a huge sweeping force that was going to come from the south. And then we came in from the north, infiltrated in to hit the C2 node um, prior to kickoff so we could disrupt everybody um, before we went in. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was a wild wild op we did a you know a lot of engagements um i think the whole op they took out like close to 70 um foreign you know fighters and then you know we we got some chechnyans and some arabs and in, in there when you know i uh on one of my engagements we had uh, it was like four to six chechnyan fighters that that were that they were lighting us up pretty good and they were shooting at us from a building and i uh i took an apache and we threw a november inside uh, the doorway and smoke these guys but you know we recovered you know we did a, a bda on on the building and you know uh, keith bishop actually at that time he pulled off like a g3 sniper rifle off one of those chechnians so they, they they were like kitted up there was a real deal they had nods like i mean that was a wild op um and then you know um from there um you know we lost a lot of guys on that crash and then um we actually, the, my last op on that deployment is when I had my fratricide incidents. Um, which I'm not going to get too too deep into that one today just because I like people to read the book. I, I go in detail in, in the book about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to really misspeak about that because there's a lot of details that happened that, 
you know, I kind of, I kind of throw in the book so people understand, you know, kind of, kind of the whole story. Um, but, you know, that was November of 09 and we were actually on that mission, we were actually packed up and almost ready to go back to the state. So we, I'd already turned over all my gear. So at the time we didn't actually have an own or own JTAC kit. So I was, I signed over all my JTAC stuff to the incoming JTAC and, um, then this personal recovery mission hit. Um, so there was an, um, uh, an army, um, I think an infantry guy that they were doing a CDS drop, um, recovering, trying to recover um, logistics pallets that were dropped in. And I think he fell in the river or I, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but he got swept down the river and drowned. So that initiated the personal recovery mission. And at the time we were the only PR team, um, I guess ready, which I don't know if I'd use that word because we were getting ready to go home. But we got called and they said, get all your gear ready. You guys are going on that mission. So I took all my gear back from the other JTAC, like, ah, you know. Um, and so it's- That's crazy you guys didn't have your own gear going out there. I mean, that was, you know, that was, that was a wild time back then, you know, like we had just start, stood up, you know, the fire platoon. So yeah, we didn't have our T and E and all that stuff. Like, um, yeah, it was, yeah, for, even my last, um, my last Marsoc deployment when I, I did a Hellman deployment. So I went out and, uh, attached to a West coast team and, I was I was bringing out two Pelican cases of gear out to those guys because they didn't have JTAC suites, you know. Yeah. So I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah, they you know. kept telling me when but, I was heading in, they were like, "No, no, no, you, you're going to get your gear when you get to F or when you get to Leatherneck." And then I got to Leatherneck, and they're like, "No one sent you with gear." We told them to make sure you had gear, and I'm like, "Oh my god, dude!" So they had to horrible. like get an Islid, you know, get all the, just like some of the basic stuff. It's like, this is crazy. Yeah. It's uh, not like you can go to the PX and buy that stuff, you know? And then some of it turned out <laughs> to like the armory had con- possession of some of the gear and didn't even know what it was. And so they, when I went to ask for it to get it signed out to me, they're like, no, we don't have that, you know? And it's like, then it come to find out they do. It's like, you just didn't realize what it was. And yeah, it's funny, man. Yeah, yeah that happens. Yeah. yeah. So that was, you know, obviously that was a huge debrief point. Like you're getting ready to go home and then you, you know, and we weren't even that full measure at that point. We had, you know, a lot of guys had been wounded or hurt or, you know, so from other stuff. Um, yeah, it was a rough deployment. Um, so, you know, we got back from that deployment and, um, well, before, you know, before, I, before you move on, can we, do, can you talk at all about like what happened? I mean, I, people should go yeah, check out the yeah. book. It's the, uh, out of the darkness. I got my copy. I've been, I want to make sure it's really, you know, it's an interesting take and it's something that incident was actually shared as a learning point to other JTACs, you know, and became a training point of, making sure you understand that it's hard, if not impossible to tell when you're attacking a target 50 meters in front of you with a gun run from an A-10, you know, it's like a, so I don't know what you want to talk about with it, but. John Dillard was, I think he's the one, one of the ones that was, he was teaching that at the schoolhouse. And Mm -hmm. then I think, I think even um, Ryan German was teaching that too, when he was at EWTG Lant. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, we, we went up there for the PR mission and of course, like we didn't have, we had to make our GRGs when we got up there. Um, the, the mission changed like three or four times when we were up there. Like, you know, we initially went up there cause we're going to recover a body and then they switched it and they're like, Hey, you're going to take the commando team into uh, a place inside, um, that was up at B, um, BMG. Um, near Fob Todd, they, they wanted us to push into like the area that was called the Bowen Alley um, that no one had been since I think it was like May of 2008. No one had been in there mm-hmm. and it was known like enemy territory. Um, to this day, I still don't understand why we did that. Like it didn't make sense to me. 
and then we didn't have the assets that we requested or needed. I mean, initially we had bone and like an MQ1 or MQ9 on, like just a pred and the and bone, which is like you can't do close air support with um, those two assets. Everybody finally, loves you know, everybody loves the B1, but the practicality of it is it's just you know it it takes time to employ. It's just got such a long. I don't know, mm. flight, you know, to get yeah, set up. Like a stuff. four minute leg to get those guys just in position half the time. And then, you know, uh, I dropped a lot with B, you know, B1s on my next deployment um, because that's pretty much all we got out in the middle of nowhere up in Dari Boom. Um, but I mean, it has its place, but when you're, sure. you know, and, you know, close, you know, within a oh, hundred meters of the enemy, yeah, it's really hard to employ something. You want something that can tip in quick with, you know, a good gun. Um, so we, you know, we did get A-10s for that and, you know, we walked in, um, on foot. So they knew, you know, they knew we were coming the whole time. Um, and we had, um, we had some, it was pretty shady. Cause like when we first got there and did coordination, they had Afghans in the, in the American jocks with us, like secret stuff open being with afghans with their radio i mean it was just i got this eerie feeling i was like this is the wild west and something bad's going to happen there was just no operational security at all um i think that actually did come out in in the investigation but um either way they had afghan police with us and those guys aren't known to be you know straight shooters um but either way you know we went in um we got to like the traffic circle area where it's like the main bazaar area. And that was kind of like the last departure point. And it was like the wild west. There was like weeds blowing. There was nobody around. You're like, ah, get your game face on. It's about to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. And then by the time we got to what they call the bowling alley, which is basically, it was a east west um, running alley that had, I think 12 foot walls on both sides. And it was just, you know, basically narrow enough where you could put, you know, a car down it. And that's where it kicked off. I mean, we got pinned down early on. I started dropping. Um, we dropped I, three GBU, um, I think 12s or 54s on buildings immediately. Um, you know, I remember turning around, getting ready to maneuver, and, I, and somebody shot a, a goose off right next to me. I get blown over. I'm like, oh, like, I mean, the Carl G will... It, it it rang me good almost knocked me out yeah backblast then, is no uh, joke yeah it yeah it put me down like i was like oh i thought we got hit but uh, then i look up and i'm like oh it's our guy shooting the, the curl g great <laughs> thanks man so um yeah and then you know we got to those buildings that we destroyed we, we finally maneuvered to them um and then at the that about that time and i'm i'm probably gonna mess this all up because i haven't talked about it in a while um, but me and my, me and Captain Glover, we moved, um, north to kind of check out, um, potential Kazovac positions and then kind of try to figure out how we were going to go about doing this. And then, then that's when like, um, our, our Sark, uh, Corman guy got shot through the neck and then, um, our, um, human guy got shot in the, I think he got shot in the femur or the really bad in the leg and they got sniped off a roof basically so we ran back to what we thought were you know buildings five and six or whatever on the grg we i was completely disoriented i didn't know where i was i thought i was in um the next buildings down so you know and we're taking like sustained fire um, we're like, dude, they're going to come through here any minute. And I'm like, let's get some guns down. There's some woods, you know, some tree lines that were right, right outside the, basically the walls that we were, you know, inside. So I was like, let's get some A-10s down on them. And so I called him in on the initial pass. He came in and I'm like, he's no, he's nose at me. So I aborted him. I was like, that's freaking weird. And then the second guy came in, he tipped in. And he looked good and I cleared him hot and, um, you know, it, it came right on me. I mean, it hit us. Like we were all on, um, I think we were on the, 
the north side of the building or something all lined up on that building and he strafed east to west right down us um i watched the guy get shredded like he just pink misted in front of me like disappeared um and i got blown i got blown off across uh, basically around the wall so i didn't even i don't even think i got hit and then um once we you know, figure out what the heck was going on. You know, I boarded the aircraft, called them, called it in that, you know, that, that was us, you know, that this was, um, you know, that we had, uh, that I had strafed my own target or our own friendlies. And then that's when um, we called back. The ODA guys had been north of our position. They were kind of um, just a, another element north of us kind of doing their own thing. We were trying to basically frog leap. So we called them back down to help us. Um, mm -hmm you know, sort the casualties. And, you know, at that, at that moment, I, I got on my cap and Glover was hit really bad in the leg. So I put, I think I put four tourniquets on him um, and got him stabilized. Um, and then, you know, once we figured out, you know, we, we were gonna have, we weren't gonna be able to move these guys all back on foot. Um, you know, we started talking about a medevac and um, I, I marked, we threw, we threw a yellow smoke outside the wall, just kind of just to mark our position. And then I don't, I don't know what happened, but basically a, a C, you know, a CH-47 came in and landed on the smoke. And we're like, well, we better get these guys in. Um, so we started moving and I had Captain Glover um, and another guy helped me with him, get him on the chopper. Um, and they basically, they landed on the south south side of the building that we were getting shot at from and the nose of the aircraft when it landed was pointing straight at the enemy they had a machine gun position there um so our whole team was inside the chopper when an rpg went through the front of the aircraft it it went through the front of the aircraft in between the pilot and co-pilot went through the control panels flew all the way to the back of the aircraft and stuck in the back of the aircraft and I, I guess it didn't go high order. It just stayed there. So they, they either didn't pull the pin or it was just a bad fuse or whatever. That's so crazy. Uh, we didn't know we didn't know this till after, obviously. Um, but our whole team was in when it happened. Um, and then we got everybody on. And we we I got off with the rest of the guys. And then we for a while we didn't we didn't know if they were going to actually make. They, they were talking about making us continue mission. Um, even with all those casualties. Um, and then finally, um, uh, Captain Finley, who was the ODA um, captain, I think he made the decision like, no, dude, we're headed back. So we, we packed it up and, and moved back to Fob Todd. Um, so yeah, that was, you know, and when we got back to the Fob Todd, the, the aircraft at Medevac was sitting there. Um, <laughs> I find out later, uh, Freaking my buddy Rod, they got shot through the neck. I mean, I thought he was dead. He was, uh, he's so bad. I was like, you know, I'm never gonna see him again. I mean, he took us through and through to the neck, like, Jeez. Up for less than an inch, one way or the other, he would have been dead. Like, and he's, I deployed with him when I went over you know, to to Damn Neck or the Dev Group. He was he was there with me. Um, He's just got cool scars, you know, a lot cooler scars than I do. <laughs> <laughs> he can keep that one, dude. <laughs> yeah, That's that was a close call. So yeah. many close calls. I mean, having an RPG fly through the length of an aircraft without hitting anything or blowing up, like, that's... Yeah, I saw pictures after of, like, the control panel. And it's like, you know, how they have screens on the front of the aircraft. It went, like, in between one of the two screens. I, I mean... By the grace of God, we survived. I can't imagine know? how that would have gone had that. I mean, you guys, that would have just been just detrimental, you know, with all already the the situation and stuff. <clears throat> had that? Had you seen that before? Had there? Had you seen any kind of close calls or fratricide incidents in country before with close air support? Well, yeah. I mean, we had we had them happen when. At times when I was over there, it just wasn't with any of my teams, you know. Yeah. I mean, once you start looking into it, I mean, it's it's crazy how often it does happen. Um, I mean, that's just, something they still teach in TACP school. That's one of the first things you learn, like the rates of fratricide 
haven't really gone down that much when we thought that all the the um the more technology and the better we get at stuff that it would go down but really it doesn't just because war is dynamic and things error. happen yeah. yeah yeah i mean i mean i i screwed that up that was all that all on me i i lost situational awareness and you know and then you know great teaching points so i mean when when i went up and started working with the seal teams as a jpac instructor um that was one of the things i would show them almost the first goes that we would do is i would you know if we were at a range and we had jets i would line them up and and have them come in on a 30 degree off strafe you know danger close and you can't tell mm -hmm. you can't tell that that guy's on target or not so it's hard um and that's on a range you know that's not even yeah in the middle of moving getting shot at you know shooting moving communicate all that it's like it's a crazy job man it's a dangerous job and that's unfortunately the reality of fire support is that's going to happen sometimes and it's i mean i don't know what was going through your mind afterwards you know like like how did you yeah, process how did you process it, on you know? target that's that's what i was hoping when after that happened i was like i might as well just stay here and die um i thought my career was over um so yeah i mean i i was I, I got flown back to um, Germany because I took shrapnel. Um, so me, it's, it's funny now that, but um, I got flown back with um, my buddy Scott Petrie. Who it's funny he was. We were on the same team together, but we were also uh, born and raised in the same town in Strong Maine. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's funny how God puts people together. You know, and he was ten years my senior, but. Uh, <laughs> He was a huge dude. Um, we always joke, like, if Scott got injured, like, we're just going to blow him in place on target because I, who's going to carry, like, a 260-pound dude? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, he used me as a crutch. Like, that's that's how big this guy is. But, uh, yeah, so him and I went back to Germany together. Um, and that, that's when the whole, like, investigation stuff hard uh, started. They actually tried to keep me in country um to do the investigation and i was lucky enough to have um fruit bat who was my my air officer at the time he he was looking after me and he said we need to get him home and they used the medevac route to get me home because i was injured um and they knew they, they were just gonna try to keep me as long as they could in country until everything was solved which i mean that's like a six-month process yeah for sure um, so i went to i went to germany and then like within in, I think 12 hours of being in Germany, I had to get in front of a BTC, in front of a, I think a two star and a one star and a colonel. And they in, basically interrogated me on what happened. Um, I, I mean, at that point, I was like, well, I got to just throw all my cards on the table and tell them, I mean, this is my fault. Like, this happened. Um, so I laid it all out. I, I don't, I mean, I, what at what point should i deny that that it, you know i didn't do it or make an excuse so but apparently i don't know for whatever reason so i was in a safe house there in germany um they they, they put um you know socom guys in to heal so we don't have to stay in a regular hospital mm -hmm. um or in regular burden and there was another colonel he was a I think he was a Delta dude. I don't know. I don't, I don't remember. He didn't really say like, but he was a Colonel and I was, he was asking me about what was going on. And I told him about how the like investigation was proceeding and like how they were talking to me. And he's like, they didn't read me my rights. They didn't do any of that stuff. And he's like, Oh, this stuff's got to stop right now. And he's like, I'm going to go make a phone call and whatever he did stopped it. Um, they, nobody talked to me after that until I got back to the States. So I don't know what was really going on. I'm sure there was some, some things going, you know. Well, I mean, you were, and you were, see. you were pretty open about like, Hey, this was a, this is just an error, you know, this is an error. And during the mission, yeah, you know, error, like, it's not like, essay, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not like thing. you were trying to lie or cover anything up. So did you, I, I imagine that probably helped when you wanted to maintain your, 
you know, qualifications and stuff like that or maintain your job? Like, how did that kind of pan out? Because I assume you had to do some kind of retraining or I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, John Dillard was our, our JTAC E at the time. He was our evaluator, instructor. Um, I thought it was going to be a long process. I thought it was going to be like, dude, you're done. Like, kick you back to the conventional side. But now he sat down with me and said, hey, you know, we want to retain you. We want to retrain you. Um, and I, you know, you, you, you knew, you knew John, right? I mean, I had met him. I didn't like know him, know him. Yeah. I mean, that, that dude is like, I mean, he was a debt one guy. He, he had been there, done that, you know? So he, he's seen it and, you know, he watched the video. It was all on video. It was, you know, and he's, he actually like him and the air officer there. He's like, I'm sorry this happened to you. He's like, it could happen to anybody. Um, so they weren't, it, they never made me feel like that uh, it was my, you know, that, it, that I couldn't overcome this and, and not retrain. But I mean, it was a pretty rigorous, um, you know, syllabus that they put me under. I ended up going out to Las Vegas for two weeks and doing a bunch of stuff out there. Um, and I had a lot of different wickets that I had to hit. Um, and then I had to have a full, you know, eval. Um, but I mean, I got... I got called up. Um, I even think I snuck in. I snuck in um, free fall too before my next deployment, which that that's another funny story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I got I got a seat and I got out there, and um, the team that I was supposed to be going to, I was supposed to go back to the same team, eight two one two, but it had obviously there was a bunch of different people changing hands and everything so we got a new uh team leader and team chief and my my team leader uh uh smith calls me and he's like where are you he's like are you out in uh pre-fall or whatever and uh i was like yeah i'm out here and he's like well you need to be back here and like he was gonna he was gonna make me come back but unfortunately uh well luckily he let me uh you know me stay out there and finish free fall because they had already started the workup i think again they were already through shooting package by the time I got, got back. Um, but for the next appointment, um, pre-fall was fun. That was, that would have been a cool school. Like one of those, man. Like yeah. people want to go to jump school and I'm like, dude, fuck that. Like if they, if they offered free fall, I'd be like, okay, let's do that. But like just going and jumping yeah, and. Static line sucks. <laughs> dude. Yeah. Static line was, was not much. Nah. I mean, I just don't like heights, you know, at the time I didn't like heights at static line and I'm like, it's, you're only like 1200 feet up and then you're jumping with a bunch of, you know, army guys that don't want to be there. Half of them. I mean, I watched, I watched the army guys get, um, uh, cargo strapped to the back of the aircraft cause they f- refused to jump. And I'm like, Holy moly, dude. Oh, like, geez. Yeah. You know, and I think if I'm in the like, plane, that's one of those times where you're like, everyone else is doing it. Am I really going to be the guy that holds this up? You know? There's always a guy, man. There's always a guy. And uh, I watched it. And then, like, they have to, like, in the morning, they perp walk them, at, like, because you're all out in formation. And they perp walk. And I guess, like, the punishment for Army is, like, sending them to Korea. Mm. So they, they're all like, ah, oh, you're going to Korea. And it's like, yeah, they always tell them they're going worldwide. <laughs> like, you're going worldwide. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you're going worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to send you to all the bases nobody wants to be at. Yeah, I was at a I was a fresh sergeant when I went to like jump school, so there was still fire in my belly, and like you have like an army PFC come up to you and start talking to you like you're like brothers, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, get out of my face! Like, go <laughs> go find go find a corporal, dude. And uh, yeah, it was like it was eye opening. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's hilarious. Like the Marines, because it's not our school and it's hard to go to, to get a seat there, unless you're with like recon or Marsoc or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, we, people hold it up on this pedestal, you know, but then you get there and it's like all PFCs. It's all like basically trained army guys and girls, you know, that don't know anything. I, I mean, it's weird how we hold it up on this pedestal, but it's like a basic entry level school for the army. You know, they're like, whatever. Oh yeah. I mean, it's hard for us to get to. So, I mean, I had a yeah, no, us, I agree. Like, at Angaco, we had to be like the top P tier, 
there for the airborne PFT for like so many consecutive months before you could go. How did that work? Cause yeah. you were there when they stood back up. I had Scott Campbell on the last episode and yep. he talked about, you know, being the first CEO and helping stand it up coming from JSOC and then coming over to stand up second angle co. How did that work with jumping? Was that even a priority at all? I mean, you guys were getting ready to go to, to Iraq and stuff. So it's not like you really needed it. Yeah. I think he got us the, the jump um, mission back. So I think he got it on, whatever they put it on that makes it actual um, a requirement for schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did all that. So like I went, I think after my second deployment at Anglico, um, but yeah, he, I mean, he worked all that stuff out. It's funny. I, I you know, I watched the Scott uh, interview and I'm like, Holy crap. Like all the stuff he's talking about, like, cause I got there, you know, as a, boot ass lance corporal yeah that's true you probably wouldn't know all that he's talking about all this all how all, all the gear came and like and i'm like oh that all makes sense now because like we were working with like you know 117s and doing satcom shots and sending you know all this like stuff that like when we had come to like the seal team and the supported seal team they would still have a pisky five and couldn't even talk on that and we we're like oh that's easy we'll send you know we'll send all your comm stuff for you um so he definitely set us up for success. I mean, looking looking back and then, you know, watching what at what he actually went through to get it all done. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah, that was a really good conversation. Yeah. I was um I was um I don't know, I really enjoyed like the you don't really get too many he was a colonel. So for those that don't that haven't checked it out, it was the last episode. Uh he was a colonel, he was a infantry officer, served with fourth recon, second recon uh jsoc like i said stood up second angle co during the global war on terror he was the 15th mu co it was interesting talking to him about being a mu co because i hated being on the mu and our mm -hmm. i did it twice the first mu co i didn't really i didn't really like and i didn't think he was a very you know inspiring leader or whatever the second one i i enjoyed more i think the officers i don't know the yeah, second my second mu deployment the co was better but it was interesting to hear his take because I'm like, dude, you're always on the hook. You got 2,000 people underneath you that could screw your career up at any moment if they do something dumb, you know? So people should check that out if they haven't. Um, yeah, we used to – I got a funny Scott story. Um, <clears throat> so he would – we'd go out to the OP, Colin and Cass and stuff, and every now and then Scotty would come up um, on the hill with us and, you know, he'd sit around and – uh, we call it Uncle Scotty's story time because, you know, and of course, like we're kind of often or, you know, us, you know, dirty little um, uh, enlisted or kind of off in our own little space and the officers are all talking, but we'd kind of like listen to him tell stories when he was in JSOC and stuff. And I think, you know, I was, I was thinking back and I'm like, man, that, that might've been the time when I realized like, you know, hearing some of his stories that there was something more than Anglico after mm -hmm. this, you know, and I kind of just like put it in my mind that, Hey, there's something better. Um, so, but it was, it was funny. He's, he's a good storyteller for sure. <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a really, yeah. I, he, he, it's funny. He's done, he's done a lot of stuff and he's very unassuming, you know, like you see him and you're like, no way, you know, like I would yeah, have very humble, very for sure. There is a very easy way to get into the special operations kind of community by being a JTAC, you know, like in the Marine Corps going over to Marsoc, you know, if they accept you and stuff. And then from there, you know, with time and experience, you can work with other units work. You, you, like you said, even if you're, even if you're not associated with like dev or something like that, you being overseas, you were working with DEA and you were working with green berets. And it's like, I think a lot of people outside the military and outside of that kind of combat arms realm don't really understand how much joint work there actually is. You know, how much of these units you had Rangers, you know, you mentioned you, you worked with Rangers while yeah. you were there. It's like all these like special, so it's funny when people like compare them all and stuff. It's like, you know, a lot of times you're all going to end up on the same freaking on the same target. You know, it's all. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, even like uh, towards my end uh, at Anglico, I was actually looking into going CCT or soft pack P because like it was kind of the point where, you know, I didn't at the time, like MARSOC was just incepted, you know? So I was like, I didn't know if that was going to be a bridge that I could cross over into. So I was like looking at my options and mm -hmm. I actually had one of those options getting out and doing, you know, the soft tac P or CCT route just so I could stay kind of in the JTAC realm. 
but uh you know it all worked out obviously but, yeah that um, was the thing i don't know how it is now i know some things have changed they've actually made i think they've actually made a different mos now for for jtax and the marine corps and it separates between jtax and fires chiefs something like that it, they've actually did what we always said they should do uh but at the time the, if you became a JTAC, the Marine Corps really only wanted you for two deployments, you know, conventional side. Hey, we want you for two deployments and then you're going to go be a fires chief somewhere. You're going to go do something else, which is always uh, the most ridiculous and asinine. It's like, hey, we're going to get you to where you're really good. You're like experienced and you kind of know, you know, you finally re- get it. You know, two deployments is a, a lot of time to like get it, kind of figure everything out, figure stuff out. And then we're going to ship you off to go do something different. You know, you're going to be a recruiter or whatever. Uh, do staff job. <laughs> you know, and that's why a lot of guys looked at the Air Force and stuff like that as an alternative because it's like, dude, that's all their guys do. If I go over there to be a JTAC, that's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to get sucked back in. Like I like what happened to me where it's like, oh, oh, you're a JTAC evaluator. Well, that's cool. We need a Mu Fire Chief. You know, like shit like that. It's like the Air Force. It doesn't seem like they're really doing that. Plus. For a while, I don't know if they still do, their controllers got bonuses, like bonus extra pay every month, and it like increased as the more experience they had. And I was like, man, yeah. like they're making it pretty <clears throat> lucrative to be a JTAC over in the Air Force, you know? Yeah, I mean, we worked when I was at Dev Group, we worked with a lot of the CCTs and TJs and stuff because those guys were the guys that attached to, you know, the SEAL teams to go on target. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had, they had it made. I mean, they got all the cool gear and, but I mean, like I always told them, you know, like, yeah, you got all the cool gear and, you know, um, you got the mission, but I was like, you you don't have the combat arms background. And I think that's where they lack. And I think that's why I wish the Marine Corps had always taken the JTAC role seriously and and made it a career uh, Mm -hmm. because we would, we would have put the CCTs and soft attack these out of business just because you know that we live and breathe fire support for for the marine corps you know, 100%. You know fires in fires integration is like that's that's what marines do yeah i mean i remember we were in kuwait when i was on the mew we were in kuwait doing a training exercise at op10 right there off of um i don't remember the name of the base uh wherever it was somewhere in kuwait and we roll up and we're gonna have uh some apaches come on station there's an army unit there that's shooting mortars and then they're going to shoot some high Mars. And I remember we roll up, I get out of the truck, go up to the top of the tower and there's this like specialist or something on the radio with the high Mars. And I was like, Hey, we're going to have 64s coming in here in like, you know, five or 10 minutes. Um, let's get this coordinated. And he's like, all right, well, I'll just shut this down. You know, we'll just cancel these fire missions. I'm like, what? why i was like let's integrate it man and he was just like wait we can do that and i was like yeah dude like you got high mars you you already got a fire mission let's work <laughs> yeah, it you know it. let's like yeah. and it was just crazy because that seemed so simple you know when you're when you're in the marines and you're a fire support guy you're a jfo you're an fo you're a jtac you look at that and go of course well if i have both assets here why not integrate them put it on a timeline or whatever and yeah. you know do <laughs> I don't know, but it was kind of, he was kind of mind blown by it. It was kind of crazy. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, man. When you, so I know you're uh limited on time. Um, we can set up another interview to, to talk about, you know, your other deployments and stuff. But if you want, what was, was there a big differences between getting ready for your second deployment with Marsoc than there was with your first? Cause both of them were, you showed up a little bit late, you know, you probably had to do some accelerated stuff to get ready. Well, yeah, I mean, cause so the second deployment that I did with MARSOC, we were doing the VSO mission, so the village stability operations, where we would get inserted into a village under a basically a um, village stability platform. So basically, you know, a small special operations team gets inserted into a village and, you know, you're, it, it's, it's the same hearts and minds when the village fight off the Taliban kind of thing. Same thing they were doing in Vietnam. They just they just called it something different. They put a diff- they slapped a different name on it, and mm-hmm. you know, with the same mindset. I think they called it the Cap, um, right? Combined Action Platoons or something like that. No, we know. called it VSO. That's what we. Were no, doing. I mean in yeah. Vietnam. I mean in Vietnam. Oh, in Vietnam. Yeah, I think you're right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's basically the same thing that they were doing. Only, you know, like when we went to Dari Boom for this for my second deployment, 
Um, we went, let's see, we, we did that in, um, I left November, November 2010, and then that went all the way through July 2011. Um, so I was in Dari Boom, basically the same place that the, the Hilo crash had happened the previous deployment, which kind of sucked because every time you go to the bazaar, you'd see the crash site. It was mm-hmm. still there. Um, and we were only about, um, about 400 meters maybe from, from the bazaar where the VSO site was. So they had basically, it was like the, the drug kingpin for that area. That was his home. And when we kicked his ass out and then um, put, put our little base there. And it was like the worst location you could put a, you know, a small, you know, special operations base. We were surrounded by mountains. We had one mountain to the north of us that went up to like, uh, I think it was like 6,000. It was something stupid. And then that one to the south of us was up to 4,000. So they literally, they had positions they would get up on. They'd, they'd put their bipods basically on an arc on the backside of the mountain and shoot them. And they would, they would arc them into, into our camp. Mm. So we actually had one of our guys, we were up in the, um, we were up in fighting positions on top of the roof and we didn't have, he didn't have a vest on and he got slapped in the back and he's like, Oh, I think I got shot. And he had, it was actually a AK round that was just tumbling and it slapped him in the back. Oh, wow. He, yeah. He got a bruise out of it. He got a cool story. Too. Did he keep the round? Uh, yeah, I think so. You yeah. got to put that on a necklace, man. That's for real. <laughs> That shit, yeah. shit, that's like that, that had your name on it legitimately, you know? Yeah. And that was at max range, right? You know? <laughs> like, that's crazy. Yeah. Did that you was feel, a fun deployment, though. you mean doing a VSO, the point is you're supposed to be helping out and showing like, Hey, here's a better way of living. We can help build a little bit of infrastructure. You don't need the Taliban, like reject the enemy, embrace democracy, and we'll all be happy. Uh, kind of deal. Yeah. But Were we you guys- when we got there, that wasn't happening. We had, you know, the civil affairs teams, which I think were some of the biggest problems we had in Afghanistan, where they were seeding money into, into the local populace for, for these building projects, like building Scams. dams and, and freaking, you know, dig, dig your ditch, you know, and like well projects, but they were seeding money without even having security. Mm. So they were funding basically the Taliban network in the area. So when we got there, luckily, you know, our captain, Captain Smith was, he's a smart dude. And he's like, nah. <laughs> and he, he's like, he like told me, he's like, Hey, get, get a, uh, get a 64 or not a 64, get a, you know, a, a Blackhawk in here. We're going to get the C8 team a ride home. <laughs> so we shoved those clowns on a board bird and sent them home. And then we went straight kinetic. We're like, it's game on. We took the gloves off. Um, and on that deployment, all we, all we did, we were driving around and, you know, side by sides, uh, ATVs and dirt bikes, the entire deployment. I mean, that was the only good mobility that you could have. And we were chasing them down. And, and I mean, we put a hurting on them in a couple months where, you know, when we initially got there, the team that we replaced, they weren't going any, you know, 900 meters outside the wire, they were getting pinned down. Like it was pretty kinetic. Um, but we were able to get a ton of white space by the time at the end of the deployment. In fact, like enough white space where the Spanish wanted to come and move in next to us because it was so calm there. Mm. So that's a good indicator of how, you know, nice it was in the Valley when we were done with it. Um, so, but that, that was, it was fun deployment. We did a lot of dirt biking and, and four wheeling. <laughs> that's not something you expected um, to be doing, right? Out, out cruising on the dirt bike. I know the, I know they used, especially JTAX and with Marsoc used the, um, Four wheelers quite extensively. There was one that got killed. That got he one rolled over on him. I remember. What? How did you like? Because they weren't regular four wheelers. They had like a bunch of stuff on them so that you could attach things to them and do different things. How did you like those? Well, so I, <clears throat> so I, I usually rolled on the back of a side by side. So mm-hmm. we had our setups. There's bench seats in the back, so I could sit back there with my rover and control and not have to worry about like driving or um, that type of setup. There's a couple times where we, we had to go out light where it was just dirt bikes and, and one four wheeler. So like the second guy and me were on the four wheeler and I was basically just hanging off the back, like controlling. Cause like, it's hard to drive and, and, and talk on the radio at the same time. So like, you know, I was a realist. I was like, there's no, 
there's no reason for me to be driving a dirt bike. Um, so there's a couple of times where we, you know, I would stay on the, on base. And if we were only sending out like a four or five man element on dirt bikes and I would control from the base and, and, you know, our guys were savvy with, with calls for fires and stuff like that. So they mm-hmm. would just act as a JFO to do anything if anything happened. So no, it was, it was really dynamic and, you know, we got a different mix of, you know, different, different types of missions. You know, that was, that was kind of the, that was the deployment that I did. Um, I got my first strike with a, with a predator. So it was actually an MC and what was it? MC one Charlie. So it was an army pred. Um, and the, we were working, basically we had this, these guys that would, if we were coming down south into these villages, they need, they, they would get heads up that we were coming down and then they would come up into basically this huge, there's this huge valley that came up into, into this, like, um, and there was a ravine on both sides. I mean, this stuff's gnarly. We got, we got pinned down inside this ravine once, but it was like, it's like, think of the Grand Canyon. Um, and the walls on this thing was like, you know, two, 300 feet tall. And it was just straight up. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would come into the mouth of this thing and set it up and, and, and ambush us just about every time we went in, down in this village. So I was like, well, let's use the MQ. We know exactly where they're going to set up. And so I had them um, basically ready with a nine line, ready to strike these guys. And we basically sent a, a, a force down to this village. And as soon as they came up, I mean, we're striking them. So, you know, we did some stuff like that. And then our SIGINT guy was like really savvy with, you know, tracking high level targets and stuff using, using that type of stuff. So we actually wor- started working. Um, I'll be careful how I say this, but um, basically layer in different types of intelligence on top of each other where we can get a battle picture for a guy that's been basically, he's been designated as a capture kill. So Mm -hmm. long as that we can get positive identification that this guy is a bad guy and he's on the JPEL list or on the, on the capture kill list. If you have enough layers of intelligence and then PID, um, then you can get uh, approval to strike them. Yeah. So we actually got approved to do some of that stuff out there, which was kind of unheard of for, you know, you know, for, for that type of mission. Um, and then, you know, when I went on to dev group, that was kind of, you know, our main, main deal doing some of that stuff. But, yeah. Um, yeah. That, that, uh, yeah, that deployment was fun. We had a good time. Um, well, that's cool, man. I mean, I, uh, yeah, so on that same deployment, you know, in that in that valley, the kind of the Grand Canyon area, we set up once uh, in an ambush position where they usually set up on us. We we got in there like, man, I don't know how, we 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 snuck in there early, and these guys came in and they came in through like basically um, the Wadi area coming in to the uh, Grand Canyon area, and and we lit them up we got a good ambush on them and then we, we kind of made the mistake of trying to chase these guys down and we went in there and got sucked down and they had, they had a machine gun position set up on top of the grand Canyon, we'll call it. Mm-hmm. And they pinned us down. Good. One of our guys got shot through and through to the leg. And uh, so luckily we had Apaches inbound. So I'm like, well, we'll get these guys. And I mean, we we're pinned down, so we weren't moving. Mm-hmm. And, it was kind of a funny story now, but uh, one of my guys, I was like, hey, Mark, the target, he knew where, where the guy was. So I was like, Mark, him, you know, was smoke and he shot it and it was a CS round and it came back down on us. And I'm like controlling the Apache, like, uh, and I'm like coughing on, on, the, on the air and the Apache thinks I'm hit. And I'm like, no, dude, I just can't breathe. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Take a big hit and to tear your ass got- between attacks. Yeah, yeah, and then we got finally got him marked, and we, you know we cleaned him up with Apaches, but and then we got our Kazza back in and got got our guy out. Um, but it's funny now; it's like yeah, we see us ourselves. That's funny. Um, it's those weird yeah. little things, right? You know that happens. Yeah. When you were on yeah, your second then, deployment, were you the only team? Were you the only JTAC on the team, or or was there another JTAC or any of the operators JTACs? No. I was the only JTAC on that 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 uh that deployment, yeah. 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 
Yeah, they were surging at that time. Like, if they could get two JTACs, they'd put them with a commando mission, which made more sense, you know? Yeah. But I think for that deployment, we only had – it was me at that VSO, and then, you know, David Stowe was um, – I think he was running the commando mission, and then uh, Chris Dosky was up in BMG. So, I don't know. Did you know Chris? Mm-mm. No, I don't think so. Yeah, he, he ended up um, – he took his life after that deployment. Um, mm. They had a rough, they had a rough go up to BMG. They lost one of the EOD guys, um, got blown up right in front of them. Um, I kind of, I write, I write about Chris in the book. Um, I don't know if you got that far in the book yet, but um, he was, um, he was a really good dude, good JTAC. He was an Anglico guy. Um, and then he kind of, he filtered back over with us in the MARSOC and, and took a team. And um, he got back from that deployment. And so we got back from that second deployment. I think it was his sixth deployment too, um, overall. And he was burnt out. Um, he needed a break. Um, and at the time, so um, our platoon sergeant at the fire platoon had left. I think he was either on a deployment or we were actually changing over to a new one. So I was like the interim like platoon sergeant by default. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I was already slated at that time to go um, to Charlie Company to take a, to go with um, 8132 for my Hellman deployment, which was my last deployment with Marsoc. So I was like packing up to go to that. And, um, you know, Gosky was like, he was in need of help. So like, I, I ran it up the chain, like, hey, let's get this guy some help. Um, he had some heart issues he was dealing with and, and all this stuff. And, Um, I thought we had it handled where they were going to take care of him. They were going to let him take care of his medical stuff. So I didn't find out later until I got into Afghanistan that, you know, he had, uh, he had taken his life. Um, And it's tough, man. Unfortunately, it, it was like one of those things where it was, you know, the leadership failed at MARSOC. Um, There was no accountability at the, the leadership level, which was very disappointing, you know, because, you know, we're expected to be held accountable for our mistakes. And then, you know, the higher echelons of leadership didn't take accountability for what happened to him. And it was a, it was a straight cover up. So there was an initial investigation. And like I, I and then like some of the other important people that knew Chris and had uh, direct contact with Chris dur- during his normal work week and, and uh, were never in, contacted during the investigation and I found this out through Chris's um he had a uh he had a twin brother but they were identical twins so and Mike was um actually an SF guy too so he was in special ops but he was he was an SF guy Mm -hmm. um and I got contacted by Mike and that's how I found out that like the, the investigation was basically getting um scrubbed under the rug so I made a stink. I, you know, I basically, I contacted the investigator and I, I laid it, I laid all my cards on the table of what happened and then what, who in the leadership was um, basically notified of his condition and what should, what my recommendations were. And then, um, and then kind of the dynamics that we had, cause we had a guy that had come in that wasn't in the community that just kind of plopped himself in as the platoon sergeant and decided to make decisions that, were, were the wrong decisions and he didn't want to take advice from people that actually knew him. So um, it actually made my exit of MARSOC a little rough um, because I was very outspoken about that. I actually got hauled into one of the colonel's office on my way. I was like, they were screwing around with me getting getting orders to dev group, like screwing around with my gear saying, oh, you're going to have to pay for this stuff that you lost, which, you know, whatever. But uh, in that whole whole rigmarole that one of the colonels at Marsoc pulled me in his office and he's like you need to you just need to let it go and, and drop the Gosky thing and I'm like mm, no I'm not gonna do that it's crazy um, it's like dude these are real lives that people are you know that are being affected you know and it's not even just like that one person the ripple effect of that one person committing suicide or you know something like that happening it just ripples to their entire family and stuff and it's like that's it's not uh, that's something I always wondered. Like, could you, when you're when you're over there with with Marsoc and you're, you know, at the time you guys were just pushing out on deployment after deployment. You know, dwell time wasn't really a thing. 
could you go, yeah. Hey, I need, I need a break. Like it, was there a way to like bench yourself or be like, I mean, or was that just like shut, you know, one, was it shunned, you know, or would you be shunned if you did that? Or two, was everybody so set on being the best at their job and being good that no one wanted to say no to a mission? You know, was there that, that kind of pressure? Well, I think I can only talk about myself, I guess, in that respect, but I, I always felt that I couldn't say no because I didn't want to let people down. And it seemed like that, you know, that, and that's what ended up being the detriment of my career when I, when I got up to dev group, cause I could never say no. And then I, I, I reached complete burnout and just fell apart towards my end um, of, of my time up there. And when I did ask for help, you know, I, I said, Hey, I have a drinking problem. I, you know, I, I have to drink myself to sleep every night. Um, I take pills, um, painkillers, muscle relaxers, like, just to function on a daily basis. And, you know, I raised my hand and said, I had, I need to go to rehab and all this stuff. And that's, that's when I kind of realized real quick that I was just a small cog in the wheel and that, you know, once you become, you know, not an asset and more of a liability that they, they just kind of, well, let's get somebody else. So. Yeah. I mean, when you're, do you understand that kind of mindset or is that something you think needs to be changed? I understand the mindset, but the problem is that's not what's conveyed to the operators and, and the, um, the support. They, they tell us that, you know, that we're, you know, assets, but then there's like, especially when I was with the SEAL teams, there was um, definitely a dual citizenship um, relationship there. The operators were treated completely differently than the support guys which I understand to some respect, but in some other regards, like it was just, they didn't care. So, but it is what it is. You know, it's weird. It's, it's weird. It's like, Hey man, if you're, if you're not being good to your like attachments, your combat attachments, for sure. Like you guys are all going to be on the same X together, you know, like, it's not like, I don't know. I don't understand the, that kind of mentality. You know, I get it. If you're like a new person and they're like, Hey, we don't know this guy. He's kind of an unknown right now. I get the kind of standoffish like that, or like, uh, maybe a kid glove in you, or, you know, to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. But once you've like kind of proven yourself, it's like, what am I, you know, I don't know. Well, it just, to me, it's just always weird when there's people like that out there. Like, you have I think yourself. that's kind of the issue too, is like with my career is, you know, I did, you know, three deployments with Angus Poe, then three with Mar- Marsoc, and then I went to dev group to do four deployments. So I'm, I'm with attached to SEAL teams like in Somalia. And like, this is a good example. So I'm in the med tent getting, um, worked on because I had shrapnel in my face from when I took a grenade to the face on, on my last Marsoc deployment. Because at the time I still had a lot of the shrapnel in my face. So I couldn't feel my face and then it would it would cause headaches and and, uh, and I was having a lot of issues because mm-hmm. I basically didn't get any of that stuff taken care of because I just wanted to push the fight. And one of the SEAL shooters came in and he's like, what the hell's wrong with you? pussy and i'm like oh well it's like i you know i took a grenade to the face a couple of deployments ago and i'm just trying to get to see if i can get the shrapnel out and he's like oh it's like yeah dude because you don't because that's the problem a lot of those guys they don't get to know you yeah um and they think they're the big guys too yeah but there's a lot of good guys it's like any any environment there's always some really good dudes and then there's guys that that are you know they they run with pride so, yeah, I I ran into that working with the recon guys on the Muse on the on the different Muse. You'd have really cool like recon guys that were um, very understanding of how attachments should be used and how they're an asset and stuff like that. And then and it was mostly the younger guys that were very like the bravado. I'm a recon dude, like walking around like. Sorry for my camera yep. moving. My dog keeps bumping into it. But they were walking around like, I'm a, rec-, you know, like, mm-hmm. fuck you, po-, you know, kind of that kind of mentality kind of deal. Yeah, and no, it's I, usually the younger dudes that just don't know any better, yeah. I guess. So the younger seals are the same way. Yeah. They would come in and like, I'm like, hey, dude, nope, I'm not the guy. And at the time I was, I was a drunk, angry dude. So I just didn't, 
I didn't put up with it. So that created a lot of friction too. That was my fault. So I always thought, I always thought people did best by just staying in their lane. You know, it's like, I'm not trying to be a seal. I'm not trying to be a recon guy. I'm over here just to be a JTAC and be an asset. You don't try to be a fire support guy. Like if it's a fires thing, then let me be the expert. If it comes to sniping and reconnaissance and all that, I'll let you be the expert, but you know, stay in your lane and then you don't really have issues, but man, but this has been, yeah, I, think, I think a lot of that's just maturity. You oh know, yeah. A lot of sure. the guys that I had issues with, like it was just, they weren't humble and they, I think they had a chip on their shoulder for whatever reason. And they thought I was the easy target mm -hmm. to take out that. <laughs> and I wasn't an easy target. Especially so. when you've it, done it multiple deployments, you know, and they don't even realize it. It's like, dude, especially if it's like yeah, an operator know. that this is like their first deployment. And they're walking around like they're hardcore. And it's like, okay, I mean, cool, man. That's awesome. This is like my fourth or whatever, you know, like, yeah, not that that matters, yeah. but it's like, don't try to denigrate, you know, me and what I'm doing just because I didn't become a seal or whatever, but yeah. And that's usually, that's usually how I caged it too. Cause like I was all about going over to dev group to do fire support. That's all I cared about. I didn't want to go on target. Like that wasn't why I came over there. Mm -hmm. um, and I would convey that to him, like, hey, if I wanted to be a SEAL, I would have been a SEAL, but I'm not. I wanted to be a JTAC, so I'm a JTAC. Like, so I'm going to stay in my lane, and I'm going to do my job. It's yeah. going to be good. So, For sure, man. Yeah. So after after the second MARSOC deployment, um, I was able to um, I was able to score Pathfinder. So I went How'd to, you like that? Oh, man, that was... I've heard it's technically difficult because yeah, a lot of memorization and stuff like that. And that a lot of people I've talked to that have gone said it's not what they thought it would be. Yeah, it's definitely not what I thought. I thought it was going to be more like time in the field and stuff. And it was just all basically uh, in the classroom stuff. Um, but hardest, hardest course that I ever went through through my whole career was Pathfinder. Wow. And like day, day one, you know, we had a class of 70 something people um and you're sitting at like these long like bench like tables in this really congested classroom and they sit all 70 in that classroom and they said hey look to the left and look to your right those guys are not going to be here at the end of the you know couple weeks and they were right like there was over a 60 percent washout rate for pathfinder um that's crazy I, by, the, by the seat of my pants i made it through i, I was lucky i had it was me and another recon sergeant we were the only two Marines in the class and I've never studied that hard in my life. Um, cause yeah, it's all me memorization, you know, so you have to memorize cause you do, you do sling load stuff the first week. And then, then you do, um, like Kazovac and DZ and how to set up a DZ and then doing all the math to calculate like your drop point, like when you release it from the aircraft, like all that stuff, like, I, I suck at math, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, um, yeah, so it hurt. Um, but the memorization part was the big, big thing. And then, you know, so army testing always seems to be like that. I, 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 I hear jump masters the same way where you have to memorize like everything and you have to do it in a certain sequence. If you don't do it in that sequence, you know, if you don't pat your, your head and rub your tummy, um, yeah. you're done. So that's, I hear that uh, same thing about, uh, DI school. It's, it reminds me of what people told me about DI school where they have to like, they're like, yeah, there'll be like a three page command that you have to memorize. And it has to be verbatim line by line with pauses in specific places and stuff. Not, not exactly the same. You guys are memorizing like chain links and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. You almost become a, um, what is that? A, uh, not a logistician. I mean, it is a logistician, but like the red tab, red tab people, you almost become like those guys because you get, trained in bringing in supplies to these HLZs, right? Loading and stuff. Oh, I think I lost you. Sorry about that. No, you're all good, okay. man. It's snowing here, so it's all downhill from here. <laughs> I'm in San Diego. We had, a, uh, you know, no weather, basically. There was snow up in the mountains, but yeah, nothing for we're us. We're supposed to get six, five, six inches tonight. Um, but the mountains here got destroyed. Yeah. Anything over 2000 feet got like five or six feet. Some of these, um, some of these people have been trapped in their houses for over a week, like in this, you know, completely covered in snow, their houses up in the San, San Bernardino mountains and stuff. Yeah. I heard places were 
I, I watched a weather report that said that there was places over there that were thinking 10 feet. So yeah, dude. I they were that. Mount Baldy, which is in East LA County. It's up in the Angeles National Forest. They were saying when this big storm roll was rolling in that it could possibly break the U.S. record for most snowfall in one night, in 24 hours, excuse me. Uh, they were think it could have been up to 10 feet. I don't think they got that much, but up to 10 feet in 24 hours. <laughs> it's so crazy. But yeah, that's yeah. like your first floor of your house. Like, you know? dude, that's, <laughs> that's just insane, you know? And then it just kept coming too. Cause it was like a storm after a storm. So some of these people can never really get dug out. You know, you hear about these people. I know a guy, uh, I saw it on his Instagram. They were volunteering to go up with a, like a church group or something like that to help dig some people out and bring some supplies into people, you know, but, um, yeah, we were talking about, we were talking about Pathfinder and yeah, I've heard the same thing though, that it's an extremely difficult school, you know? Um, I only knew a few guys that went to it. I don't think it's one that too many people consider, I guess, while they're in the Marines, but it is one that some people do. And I've heard it's beneficial. I don't know. What are you, what were you, are you glad you went to it? Yeah, I know. Cause like on that second deployment, we did a lot of sling load operations. We did, um, you know, a lot of, um, CDS drops. So container delivery systems. So basically for your viewers, you know, C-130 comes in or C-17 or even, a, a they had, we had some special op birds that would take, you know, two or three pallets. So they'd come in, you'd set up a DZ a drop zone. Um, you basically coordinate with the aircraft, tell them, you know, you'd have pre-coordinated head-ins and then basically your drop point. And they would come in and, and drop these pallets out of the back of the aircraft. They have parachutes on it and then they hit the DZ and then you recover them. So when we were in Dari Boom for the VSO mission, the only way we could get supplies in was via air. So it was either helicopter or dropping them in. So that's how we got all of our supplies really. Like most of our supplies were dropped in. So Mm -hmm. um which was fun i mean i got i i had one one drop where i i had a i think I, it was a colonel that called me after because we uh, we had to do strike reports um basically after you did a drop just to say where all your pallets hit basically within that drop zone or outside of that drop zone if you had you know a rip shoot basically just so they they can get better Mm -hmm. And we, we had one, uh, water pallet that, that came out and the chute didn't open and it went straight into a mosque. Oh, <laughs> no way. It, oh yeah. And it like, it shattered the mosque, blew the windows out. Oh. Like, it looks like we hit it with a 500 pounder, but it was just a pallet of water. Damn. And I put it on the report because, well, I mean, it happened. And he calls and he's like, you got to take that off the report. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> it's yeah, days. it's on the report now, dude. I'm not, now I'm not going to start covering yeah. shit up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's like, how we'll, you we'll win. The, right. That's how you win I mean, hearts we and minds. Right. Yeah. We went out and made it right, but it's just, you know, that's, that's crazy. Like, well, you can't, you can't plan for that. Yeah. Out of all the places you can, you know, <clears throat> but no, that stuff was fun. I did a lot of sling loads, which um, can go really well i mean we'd sling load a lot of our containers in um that hold held our gear um on my way out um i missed it but one of the, one of the sling loads uh got cut loose and it had all of our intel and comms gear in it oh my god and they cut it loose in, into the mountains so the guys had to go recover it and luckily i was not on that mission yeah that and suck. um we had one where i called them in they were bringing in, in like a generator, like a diesel generator. <clears throat> and they had the Italian um, CH-47 sling loaded in and they stuck. And I'm like popping smoke. They call smoke. It's like the normal DZ that we we bring gear into all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like, this, this is a no brainer, dude. Let's do this. Pretty standard. And he, he comes in on head end and then I see him disappear into the village. And I'm like, what is he doing? And he comes up and I'm like, yep, the generator's not attached to the sling. Awesome. And he just, he just dumped the generator like 500 meters into the village. I'm and sure they like, got used out of here. it. That's awesome. Uh, no, no we, we broke down a bunch of walls and we got it, but, um, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. It was just, come on, dude. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's that's good the times, thing, man. you know, dealing with other, other countries and broken English and, 
Yeah, everybody uh, speaks English, right, on the NATO radios, sure. you know? <laughs> oh, my Lord. I mean, even... The Belgians and I stuff. Control, yeah, I controlled some English, or, uh, yeah, UK um, Harriers on my mm. first MARSOC deployment. And luckily, it was just, like, we were doing, like, a long patrol, and they came on station to do some ISR for us. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, dude, we speak the same language, but I don't understand a word you're saying, uh-huh. bro. Like, Maybe it was from just, Scotland like, or something. Yeah, it was so like it's a little I, thick. I don't know. Yeah, it was wicked thick. But it was I was like, I think I need an interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, man. Yeah. Oh man. Well, this has been a really good conversation, man. I'm really glad you came back on and you know, it was really it was uh interesting to do a follow up and kind of cover your time at Marsoc and stuff like that and kind of give the guys uh, a glimpse. Um people like I said before, you know, people need to check out your book, Out of the Darkness. That can be is that only on your website or is that on Amazon as well? No, it's only at uh, fullarmorfarm.com. Yep. I self published and That's awesome. <clears throat> so we didn't do the Amazon app. Yeah. Yeah, I'll put the uh, link for get... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so I, I self published did that route and then, you know, basically so I could um have the book printed in Maine and have it all made within the US. That's so awesome. that's kind of why I, I did the self publish route. Yeah. And then we also have um, the stuff at, at the same farm store, fullhammerfarm.com. We have some of the other products that we sell. So we do, you know, maple and birch syrup, maple sugar. Um, we got some infusions right now that we're doing with. Um, so we did just this last week, we did um, maple syrup infused with jalapeno. Nice. And, and then we also do um, barrel aged maple syrup in um, peach brandy barrels too. So kind of playing around with a bunch of different stuff. So that's cool, man. That's really awesome. I'll make sure to, the link will be in the show description for anybody that's listening or watching this on YouTube as uh, you just gab on social media. You're not on any other social media. Yeah, I'm at, yep. Yeah, on gab. I'm at full armor farm on gab. Yeah. And I'm at J Kramer graphics and uh, J Kramer or, Jeez, J. Kramer Graphics. I haven't used that one in forever. At Former Action News and at Former Action, guys. That's crazy. There's actually a J. Kramer Graphics Instagram page that I have, but I just don't really use it anymore. Um, But yeah, so check me out. Check out my website, jkramergraphics.com. And that's it, man.